Continuing on our I Am series, this morning we come to another of Jesus' declarations about himself. It's indeed a very bold statement, but for whoever is here this morning and believes that Jesus is their saviour and has died for them, then you know the statement has found its way into your heart, into your soul, into your very being. The statement has stood the test of time and has not only survived these last 2,000 years, but has actually increased hugely in momentum over that time. And for those of you here this morning that don't yet know the salvation that comes from belief in Jesus, my prayer today is that you would have a life giving eternal assurance that it is finished and that Jesus has paid the full price for your eternal salvation. Hopefully this message will help you see that. He's opened the road, he has shown the way, he has given us his word, he has backed it by his actions, and at the end of this road, we will have everlasting life in his presence, no matter what's going on in your life today. That's his promise to each and every one of you. Please grab it and hold it and believe it. So the scene is set. The disciples are in the upper room with Jesus. A lot's after happening already. I can only imagine that the air must be thick with tension at this stage. Because Jesus is already after stating that one of these guys who followed him for the last 12 years, one of his disciples is going to betray him. Judas has left the room to set up the betrayal, and the rest of the disciples must now be scratching their heads at this stage wondering what's going on. So now Jesus tells them that he's going to be leaving them shortly. And right up to now, they had believed that Jesus was going to conquer the Romans and usher in the new era where he was going to rule here. So this was a huge blow after the triumphal entry where you had thousands and thousands of people throwing their cloaks on the ground, waving palm branches, thanking God for Jesus' arrival, and they're probably saying to each other, here we go, now here we go, this can't go wrong, this can only get better, it's like the match is over, Liverpool are 4-0 up in the Champions League final, game is over, not quite. So now he tells them that he's not going to be with them soon. Poor old Peter is told, and this is Peter the Brave, that he's going to deny Jesus after he says that he's going to lay his life down for Jesus. And what started off as a huge and fantastic celebration is quickly unraveling in the upper room. Can you imagine being one of the followers of Jesus and seeing all that he had done? He started off small. He changed water to wine. Then he went on, healed some lepers of an unhealable illness. Demons were banished. The dead restored to life. This is amazing. It's fantastic. What can absolutely go wrong? And on top of all of that, these pious, self-righteous Jewish leaders and elders have been absolutely annihilated in any arguments and discussions they had with him. And the stuff gets better and better. And this is all at the hands of Jesus. And now this happens. And Jesus declares that he's going to be taken from them and that they're going to be left without him. Bang. Not a great feeling, I'd say, at this stage. So now we're moving into chapter 14. And the first thing Jesus says to the disciples is, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus goes on to explain that there are many mansions in heaven and he's going to prepare one for each of them and to come back and collect them and bring them with them. And he finishes by saying, where I go, you know, and the way, you know. So Thomas asked Jesus, well, where are you going? Because we don't know the way. And it's sort of typical Thomas. And then we get to this verse 14, 6, where Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. So let's check out Jesus' claim. Let's break it down a little bit, see if we can see who Jesus really was as compared to how he sometimes portrayed and how he compares to other world religions. Let's have a look at this and let's see, can he back his statement? What is the way? Well, this world has given us many various examples of how perfection can be attained. All, sadly, have fallen well short. Greece has told us to, to be wise and to know yourself. Rome has told us to be strong and discipline yourself. Judaism has told us to be holy and to conform yourself. All these great powers of belief systems that captured the imagination of millions down through the centuries have ultimately they've failed miserably. Not one of them ever guaranteed happiness. We also have many examples of how we can find up utter happiness and satisfaction on a personal note. We've all tried them out. We've all played the game. We've all done what we've done. And 
There's such a long list of it to name a few. You have your money, your power, promotions, holidays, drugs. The list goes on and on and on and on in man's attempt to satisfy himself and to, to, to feed the hunger that's within. But none of these have achieved what people have hoped for. And once again, people are left down, unfulfilled, overworked, burnt out, filled with sadness and hopelessness. So the world has failed utterly in its attempt of finding the way since time began and has led to the destruction of nations and people all over the world. You see, the problem is that if, if God did actually create this world as he says he did, but yet people take God out of the equation when they're looking for the answer, well, how are you going to solve the problem? Because you have the problem, you have the answer, but you're taking the answer out of the problem, so you can't, you, you can't have an answer. It's impossible, because God is the missing piece in the jigsaw puzzle. Man has tried everything, everything in our minds, but has always come up short. An American psychologist once said, his name is Rollo May, many of you probably heard of him, he's there in here. He once said, it's an, an old and ironic habit of human beings to run faster when we've lost our way. Mankind wants to find his solutions, but when lost and running in the wrong direction, it only leads to running further away from God and to the answer that God provides, which is Jesus Christ. So who was Jesus? He was a real cool dude. I'd say a real class act to hang around. He's not at all how he's portrayed sometimes. He always spoke up for the poor, for the widow, the fatherless, the sick, society's black sheep like prostitutes, tax collectors, and anyone who was being browbeaten and bullied. Jesus always held his ground, and while he never sanctioned sin or approved sin, he was always willing to show forgiveness and restoration if people truly wanted it. He had no fear of the Jewish leaders and the priests, always challenging them and calling them out on their show of holiness, stating that basically they were no better than whitewashed tombs. Looked fantastic on the outside, but not so great on the inside. Jesus always looked out for those of us who needed looking out for. So is Jesus the way? Does his character fit in the, the, the character that we need to find the way that leads us to eternity? And why should we go this way? So let's have a quick look at his characteristics. Who was he? As opposed to the world. Jesus was compassionate. The world has no compassion. Jesus was a servant, even though he led, he washed feet, and the world wants you to serve it. Jesus was loving. He was forgiving. He was prayerful, gentle, patient, self-controlled, humble, all of these things. And I'd say you could ask, put another 20 with us, no problem. All fantastic attributes that are total opposite to what's in the world today. We don't have time to look at all of these characters this morning. I could probably, as I say, list numerous more. We just look at that character of Jesus as compared to the character of man. Imagine if in the world today we had even 1% of the population that same, shared the same characteristics of Jesus without all the flaws. There's a huge gulf between where Jesus' mindset is and man's mindset. And in short, basically, in three years of Jesus' public ministry, which culminated in the crucifixion, he absolutely destroyed thousands of years of Satan's influence because Jesus was everything and did everything to show mankind the way back to God. And he completed the prophecy given in Genesis 3.15. Um, it'll probably pop up there in a second. Which says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So Jesus' death was a major blow at the time, but it had to happen in order to destroy Satan's work and open the door fully for all who believe in him. This was how he crushed Satan's head and showed us the way. Not just by words, but always with his words came actions. He cleared the path of all the rubbish and the debris that we were tripping over in our attempts to get to God. And through his death on the cross, he has held out his hand and says today and always to any and all who is willing to listen, take my hand. Let me show you the way. Follow me and I'll lead you home. And that's his promise to us. Paul says in Acts 4.12, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved. So in a world full of chaos and troubles, 
where Job 5-7 rings very true for most of us, if not all of us here today. And it's one of my favorite verses in the Old Testament. It says, yet man is born to troubles as surely as sparks fly upwards. And I would say if I was to ask today, anyone here today who's not going through troubles, there'll be no hands up. I mean, it's one of the truest sayings that I tell you ever coming across. But isn't it great to know that Jesus has done it all? And no matter what happens in your daily life, you're on a journey and no one can snatch your salvation from you. It's guaranteed for all who believe in Jesus and what he's accomplished on the cross. Life might be the pits right now and maybe there aren't any answers at the moment, but notice one fact. Jesus has been there before you and has gone through the trial. Whatever your trouble, whatever your problem, just make sure you keep a hold of his hand because he will walk with you through this trouble if you allow him and he will help and comfort you while you're going through it. The world has no answer for your trouble and it won't wait for you while you struggle through. But Jesus will. And as we've seen earlier and right throughout the New Testament, Jesus loves to be involved in our struggles. He's already crushed Satan's head and he won't fail. No matter how many times we fail him, he will never, ever, ever fail us. And I know this is stuff that we've all heard before many times from the time we became believers. But you know what? We just keep, need to keep reminding ourselves because our life goes on and we need to grow with it. Struggles are where we really find our faith and our faith strengthens. And as Charles Spurgeon, a famous British preacher once said, little faith, a little faith will bring your soul to heaven. But great faith will bring heaven to your soul. And, you know, if you've had tough days or, you know, you, everyone knows where the, the nice place is, the, the happy place. Like, you've had a tough day at work, you want to get home. I want to get in home, I want to sit down, have a cup of coffee, chill out. No hassle, no problems, don't talk to me about anything. It's a real sanctuary. And maybe that's the last place you need to go if you're looking for a break. You need to get out to the beach or something like that. It's, a, it's our sanctuary. We look for a sanctuary. And fa our faith is what's going to give us the ultimate sanctuary in time to come. We're like little, little breaths of steam here at the moment. We're just flitting through. And before we know it, we'll all be gone out of here. And that's where we're going to get our, 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 real, our real peace, our real sanctuary. And it's going to be everlasting. And so we go through trials and we go through troubles and struggles and so on and so forth. And they're going to happen today and tomorrow and forever. But it does come to an end eventually. So you just hang on to your faith because he has given you the way. And as we've seen, the truth, the truth of this world is pretty distorted. It can be anything you want it to be and can change from person to person, from nation to nation. No problem. The reason for this is that people don't like to be held to account. I don't. And so they make their version of the truth suit their lives and lifestyle. So let's be honest and agree that none of us like to be held to account and it can be a real pride kicker when we're singled out and criticized. And this is the same across the planet. But when we decide that there is a truth and when we want to know more about it, well, then we go searching. And he who holds our hand along the way will also lead us into all truth. And I remember when my dad passed away. My dad was like my God before I knew God. And he had his problems. We all, I knew he had his problems. There was, there was no doubt in that. But he was, he was a good bloke. And he always provided for us and always looked out for us. There was eight of us in the family. And his death was, it was a sickening blow. And I wanted to know the truth about my dad. So I, I went to the, I was, we were in Catholic church at the time, but my mother had become a Christian. So I went to the local priest to find out, you know, tell me about my dad. Because I thought my mother was a loony. I thought she was gone after going bear me because she was on about this Jesus and so on and so forth. And in our faith, we never... Never put much emphasis on it. So I went to the priest and I asked him. And he put his hand on my shoulder. I'll never forget it. And he said, Mark, just pray and hope for the best. That's all any of us can do. And I came away feeling, oh, that is so miserable. It's, it, 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 it's no good to me. Because it doesn't give me an answer. It doesn't give me any hope for the future. And there was, if that's the truth of it, so what difference does it make to any of us? You're just like a bit of dust. You're going to live, die, and be gone. But John 16, 13 tells us, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. And I remember coming to the knowledge of Christ through my mother eventually and the difference that it made to me, to my hope, to my, my, my spirit, to, to everything within me. In good days and bad days, it just gave me such a hope in myself that, do you know, this, this is a path worth following. This is someone I need to start looking deeper into. 
because you can pick any world leader today or from the past couple of hundred years, and I guarantee you that you will find that some of the things he or she has said have been utterly untruthful. You can look at any of today's so-called superpowers. They're all spewing out their own version of the truth. Have a look at our current inquiries going on to some of the scandals that have occurred. If you pick any of them, the, the cervical smear um, testing, the guard of whistleblowing, name a few, but it's all about who said what and where is the truth. And these leaders of organisations are all blaming this person or that person, and it's all about covering the back and attempting to cover themselves. And as has already been stated, it's almost impossible to find a truthful answer. But thanks be to God, our Father, that he has given us his word, which is the truth as for us, for those of us who believe, because we just know it in, deeper in ourselves that, that the word is the truth. And we've seen it many times. And the Bible has stood the test of time. And all the challenges from any who would attempt to discredit it down through the centuries. There's no other book that has been attacked like the Bible has been attacked. People have been flogged and tortured and slaughtered because they've found to have this book in their possession or they've found to have it inside in their hearts and they've, they've expressed it and they've been killed. This book of truth has divided families and nations and millions, millions, millions have been martyred because of this book. An investigation that I was checking up online recently into religious deaths tells us that over the past 10 years alone, more than 850,000 Christians have been killed throughout the planet because of their faith. It's a, it's, it's a figure worth thinking about. We have a really good here. We have a real opening here. And these people go through it all. They go through the fire and they hold strong to their faith. And as Paul says to us in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, he says, And we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. So we're on this path, following the way, and he tells us that he is the truth. What Jesus says here is that his word needs to be closely looked at, studied, and followed. Today we find the truth in the Bible, and what does the Bible tell us about how to get to heaven and to the Father? What does it tell us about life and happiness? What does it show us concerning fears, anxieties, and troubles? Simple answer is, we're not going to see it this morning, but the Bible is littered with advice on how to deal with all your problems and how to find truth and how to hold the truth and how to use the truth to get you over these problems. We'll give you a few examples. Philippians 4, 6 and 7, where we're told not to worry, but talk to God and his peace will guard and protect us through Christ. And he says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the way and the truth. And for a believer this morning who's here, this is it. I have the way and I have the truth. This is how I get to the next stage. John 8, 32 tells us, and you shall know the truth, and that truth will make you free. So for any who are here today and you don't really know that too much about Jesus yet or you're a bit iffy about him, check it out. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Psalm 26, 3 tells us, for your loving kindness is before my eyes, and I have walked in your truth. Folks, as I look across the church this morning, I can guarantee you that there's no one who trusts Christ for their salvation in here today that can't verify that not only is this book true, but also in one way or another, you can verify that when you've clung to the word for hope and comfort, You've never been left down. As God shows us his love by giving Jesus, he doesn't leave it there, but he didn't follow it up with his word to help and encourage us to stay on the path and to hang in there. And as I say this, I've no doubt that every believer can immediately think up numerous ways that we've barely held on at times of great difficulty and ransacked the Bible, God's own truth, in order to cling on by our fingertips to get through. Um, we could go into different examples of it in our own lives or whatever and think of different things, but look, they're there, we all have them. And there's, it's a time for personal reflection where you can just say, yeah, I remember that or I remember this. And it just encourages your faith. And it's a fantastic feeling when you remember how God has helped you and carried you through the tough times. Doesn't it encourage you to remember those days of how you felt when you knew God was with you and brought you through? So perhaps you're going through a major trial right now. Chances are a good few of us here are. God holds our hand and he will bring us home. 
no matter what your sickness or difficulty, know this truth from God's own mouth. When we are told in Isaiah 53, 5, that he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes you are healed. So believer this morning, be at peace and be healed. Enjoy the love and compassion showered in you day by day and rest in his finished work. Through your trial, remember that Christ has shown us the way and God gives us the truth of his word to cling to. And he gives us the comfort of the Holy Spirit, which he has promised us. And that's what we hold on to. He's our constant companion. So if you're here, as I say to you this morning, you don't know Jesus, can I encourage you not to leave the building without trying to find out a bit more about him? You've absolutely nothing to lose. Nothing at all. We've all been there at one time or another. It's why we're all here this morning. Where you are now, I once was, but concluded that I needed God to help me and to show me the way, to show me the truth, to show me the life. I needed hope, and I needed an answer, and God answered my cry. If you've that similar cry, if you've that similar need, take him up on it. He won't let you down, I promise you. So what's the life for the believer? It's the last point that we're making this morning. Let me just have a quick look at it. The vast majority of people today, they live their lives as they did in the Old Testament book of Judges. Whereas in Judges 17.6 it tells us, In those days Israel had no king and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. There was no direction, no fear of God, no need to be accountable. Everything was cool, man. Ring so true today in our so-called modern world where every opinion is right. If it makes you feel good and doesn't break the law, then that's okay. Or else we can just change the law so it fits with the majority's opinion anyway. But we know that's not how it works. And we also know that as Hebrews 9.27 tells us, it's appointed unto man once to die, and after death comes the judgment. And nothing will be hidden from God on that day. And we need to live our lives as if tomorrow was the day of judgment. Now God, in his goodness, has given us new life through Jesus. He has shown us the way, which is Jesus. He's led us along the path towards our goal, which is eternity in the presence of God. He has put the hope and truth before us and shown us how to get there. Ecclesiastes 3.11 tells us, God has set eternity in the human heart. In every human being that ever lived, there is a God-given awareness that there's something more, that this transient world, and with that awareness of eternity comes a hope that we can one day that we can one day find a true fulfillment not afforded by the vanity of this world. Anyone who believes that Christ has taken their punishment on himself and has opened the way for them to be eternity in the presence of God knows this feeling. But with this knowledge, we also have a responsibility. And this truth that leads to eternal life is not meant to be kept hidden and to yourself. You've been wonderfully saved, each and every one of you who believes in Jesus this morning. You've been absolutely wonderfully saved. It's an absolute miracle, and don't ever doubt it. And you've been restored. You're not the broken down machine you once were. You've been restored by God himself. He's touched you, and he's after restoring you. Don't ever forget that either. And he's revealed Christ to you because he wants to complete your salvation, and he wants to show you exactly what he's done for you so that you can do it for others. But don't hide that light. It has to be shared. It's, it's, it's a commission we've been given. You've been given an incredible treasure, and with that treasure comes a commission from Christ himself. And when he tells every believer in Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. It can be a very difficult, terrifying thing to do at times. You can feel really under pressure, and Satan is going to come against you. But just think back to some of the greatest moments of your life. If you've had any hand, act, or part in bringing salvation to the heart of someone, I guarantee you, as a believer, it's one of the greatest feelings you will ever, ever, ever have. And we've all benefited from Jesus as being the life. And if you're trusting Jesus today, you've already been touched by the Savior's healing hands. You've been comforted in distress. You've been soothed through your worries. You've been healed from numerous hurts and losses. And many are still this morning being cared for. Right as we talked this morning, they're being cared for and nurtured and minded and brought through another flamey fire as you're being led home by the Savior. Let me tell you what I know about Jesus, my own personal life, what I've seen, how I know that Jesus is real. I've seen him come into a home that's been full of devastation. I've seen him comfort those who have lost a loved one in incredibly tragic circumstances. 
And I've seen those people go from absolute and utter certain debt through their depression and sadness and despair. I see them being touched by the Lord and I see them being saved. And today I see those same people, it's probably 10, 11 years down the road now, and they're some of the strongest evangelists that I know inside in this city. And I know them and I've seen them and I know it's true. And they go from home to home in the north side, the south side of the county. It doesn't matter. They travel up the country, down the country, and they bring Christ into the houses that have been broken like they were broken one time. And they bring hope in with them. And they make Jesus known because these people have not only shown Jesus in word, but also in action. I've seen them work through people with severe disability by bringing word and song to cheer up my own very soul and strengthen my faith. And I've seen it, I've felt it, I know it. It's a fact, it's not, it's not a thought, it's a fact. And I'm sure you've all seen this as well by people who would be considered hugely disadvantaged. I've seen the same man with that disability share the gospel and I've seen people come to faith through him. Yet the world as we know it would pity him. But in my father's kingdom, he's an accomplished soul winner. And don't ever forget that. The truth is that in the worst of circumstances and when life has thrown a mighty lump of muck straight in your face, I've seen God step right in and turn the situation on its head. And those who would think should be complaining most, instead bring the most glory to God. They love him the most. And I've seen all this, so I know it's true. And you've seen it. You've all seen it. You've seen the true people. We've all seen the true people. And that's why we know that what we say is the truth. Because the people who have suffered most seem to give the most. Because they know the deep pain but you also know the deep joy, because the deeper your pain, when you come out of that pain, the greater your joy. And they're just, those people are just bursting to share it. They're your heroes, they're your real heroes. And they know where the true life is, and they know who gives the true life, and they know that life is worth nothing without our relationship with God. And that's why the sick, the widowed, the downbeaten believers that I know refuse to give up. They know their God, and they know the way, and they believe in his truth, and they cling to it for their eternal life. It, it, when I do think of this, it really helps me to shut my own mouth and to stop my own complaining. Or when I have a little ache or a little pain or something going on, or Lorna's nagging me as usual, or whatever it is, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great way for me to stop all this and, and to think, my goodness me, I'm only putting up with something small, they're putting up with something huge. Sorry, Lauren. And yeah, you see, God wants us not only to partake with Jesus, but he also wants us to bring those who don't know him yet so that they too can open the door when he knocks, so that he can come in and have a relationship with them. He has given us a great commission to go out and share the good news. We were shown the way, so now we know the way, and we can lead others on that way. A bit repetitive, I know, but I'm trying to get this point across to you. We've heard the truth, so share the truth. Give to others the opportunity to, to believe that you were given. We are forgiven. You're counted as equal heirs with Christ. You're cleansed from all unrighteousness. You're part of the family of God, and you will share in eternity, and you will have an incredible future because you have new life because of what Jesus has done on the cross. Do you believe it this morning? Do you believe it for yourselves? Is it a yes? Do you believe it? Do you believe it's true? Well, then you know the goodness that's come from it. You know how it's made you feel. Maybe not right now, but you know how it's made you feel, and you know how it's going to make you feel in the future, and you know when you go to your sickbed that you have a security that the world doesn't have. We know that. You see, we know this, and there's nobody going to take it away from us. There's, you can't take it away from us. Ask the 850,000 people that have died in the last 10 years because of their faith. Nothing will take it away from them. Share it. Put your light on the hill. Put your light on the hill. Whether you share it with one or one million, it's not really important. It doesn't matter at all. But if Jesus has told you today that he has died for your sins and will bring you home. Oh, and by the way, said Jesus, in my father's house are many mansions. So our job is to make sure they get filled. So let's go fill up those mansions, folks. The people are out there waiting. The crops are ripe. Laborers are few. You can do it one on one, one on a hundred. We've all got different qualities. But let's use it. Let's use what he's given us. He's given us a gift. And you don't even have to say, just, just, just ask God to put words in your mouth. I've done it myself many times. Like when you just, oh, I can't say anything here. God, you better, if you want to say something, you better say it. I'll sit here, but you talk. And you get a word. Or someone asks you a question. 
that they shouldn't be asking and all of a sudden it opens up a whole conversation that goes on for six months and it has done and goes on longer and longer and longer and we've had some, some of our best friends we've had in 10 or 11 years and it started with one question. Sinners are in need of forgiveness. It's time to become a leader. Everyone here is a leader because you've been given such a nugget. So lead the way. Share Christ's truth and lead those who are willing to the new life that is in Christ Jesus. Thanks be to God for Christ. Amen.